So I'll ask uh, Mr. DeBilio. If you would, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with the uh, board of managers. We'll call that meeting to order. I trust everybody had uh, an opportunity to review the materials that were sent out by Tracy in advance. Um, if you have, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes from last month's meeting, which I so, missed. So moved. Second? Second. Sir. On the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Meetings. Minutes are approved from July. Uh, anybody from the public who wishes to address the board on the agenda item of the Juvenile Detention Center? Stepping forward, so we'll move forward to juvenile detention center report. It's going to be given by Mr. Jeffers. Ms. Stein is. She's on vacation. Stein. Yes. Good afternoon, board. Good afternoon. The county's juvenile detention center board of managers monthly report for August 2018. Item one: the facilities admissions for July were eight. I'm sorry, were ten. Uh, the year-to-date for males were 103, the year-to-date for females were 12. Days of service in July, males were 126, females were 87. Years-to-date for uh, males were 915, and females were 186. Juveniles housed in other facilities <coughs> outside the county for the month of July, uh, males were zero, females were two. Uh, year-to-date costs for males were 15000 and year-to-date costs for females are 20000 uh, There is no income for the month of July. Overtime status for the month of July, uh, the status was $11,434, $534.16. The hours for July are not here. I'm going to go with 373. That's probably just a typo. The breakdown of overtime hours are there for everyone to see, 373 hours. Uh, staffing status report notes to give the board effective August 10th, 2018. The Lackawanna County Juvenile Detention Center voluntarily forfeited their certificate of compliance to the Department of Human Services. The center will no longer be able to house any juvenile for an extended period of time. The center will act as a temporary processing center. The officers that remain will act as transporting officers until the permanent location is completed. Seven officers remain and one supervisor. The supervisor has been moved to the hours of 9 to 5 as she is a female and can transport if a female should be detained. She will be responsible for any transports that may take place between the hours of 9 to 5 Monday through Friday. The female adult probation officers will continue transporting after the hours of 4 p.m. and before 9 a.m. and, of course, on weekends. That concludes Ms. Stein's report. Um, <coughs> any questions? Brian, how, how is uh, an extended period of time? If you know, I realize. Well, I think they're going as a processing center now. Judge, and I think what the what the the board and the, the commissioners uh, and the, the judges have alluded to or or coming to agreement to that they will be somehow processed in the new processing center behind the county prison when that opens up. So I would believe that they're going to be out there for that extended period of time. But I could be wrong, and, and someone else could answer that if they know any more information on it. We're looking at an alternative of actually holding them at the at the courthouse. We're not sure if that's going to happen yet because we actually have opportunities to keep the juvenile detention uh, building open until uh, late uh, November 19. So we're in pretty good shape there. But um, the last destination will be at the uh, new Central Court area out on Wyoming Avenue when it's all said and done. When is that supposed to be up? Yeah. We're hoping by the end of 2019. So what do we do in between? They're staying out there. We're allowed to keep them there. We're still our ongoing 
or ongoing contract with whom? With, with Lackawanna Junior College. I thought you voluntarily forfeited the certificate. We're allowed to use it just as a holding area until they're actually moved. What happens is they're transplanted. So I guess that was the, well, how long are we holding? Well, they're holding. They're, no, they're, they're holding is only like a matter of hours until juvenile probation is contacted and it's decided if they're going home with their parents, or they may go into Vision Request, or they may be going to Northumberland County. Compared, depending on the severity of whatever issues they're there for. Well, that's what I was getting. So it would look. It would work as a processing center right now until the extended period of time until the next processing center is is ready, which would also be with the same amount of hours. You know, when a juvenile is picked up and brought in by police, uh, they'll be housed there, guarded there, and then eventually transported to uh, either Vision Quest, Northampton County, or as Commissioner uh, O'Malley said, uh, back to their parents or a guardian. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you. That's okay. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. So moved. Second. Second. On the question. All in favor. Aye. Any opposed? Any other business for the board of managers from the members? Okay. Anybody from the public uh, need to address the board of managers? Yes, ma'am. This would be the appropriate one for questioning the juvenile detention facility. Yes. yes. Okay. Good afternoon, Melissa Welshko Williams from Madison Township. Um, I did. Re I was told to ask at this meeting at, by the county commissioners. I was wondering how long is the average stay at somewhere like the Vision Quest facility in North Pocono? You know, we don't have those answers. The director isn't here. Okay. That's something we can have answered in the next meeting. We're going to call the and ask for Director Stein. Director Stein. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Ryan, when is she coming back? She, I was just going to say, I was, I was just going to grab real quick. She won't be back till next Monday. She's, she's going to be off this entire week on vacation, then she'll be back. She'll be back Monday. before September 13th. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't have that <laughs> much time. Board no, of right. meeting at North Pocono, so. Okay, no, no. Thank you. All right. Anything else uh, for the Board of Managers? Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Other question. Aye. 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 meeting is adjourned. We'll move to the prison board. Call that uh, to order. Likewise, with the minutes uh, for the prison board meeting of July, I'll entertain a motion to approve those meetings. Minutes. Second. Second. On the question. All in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. The meeting minutes from July are approved. All right, anybody from the public wish to address the board on the items that are listed on the agenda? Okay. So I'll move forward to Kelly's coming uh, forward. So we'll go to the list of motions. The first motion is to approve the current payables for the Community Corrections Center, the Juvenile Detention Center, and the Lackawanna County Prison. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. On the question. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. Uh, all current payables for the Community Correction Center, Juvenile Protection Center, and Prison as listed in the report. Okay. okay, so we'll move to the controller's report, Mr. William. Yes, Judge, uh, the controller's office reviewed the prison inmate and canteen account reconciliations which were prepared by the prison business office for the month of July of 2018 and found no discrepancies between the reconciliations and the bank statements. The balance in the inmate account was $398,355.75 as of July 31st of 2018. The balance in the canteen checking account was $530,734.41 as of July 31st. 2018 and in addition as of July 31st 2018 the canteen account owned 
two certificates of deposit, one valued at $15,000 and the other at $131,943.09, which totals $146,943.09. And that concludes my report. Any questions for the controller? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve this report. Second. Other question? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the controller's report for July 2018 is approved. For the Community Corrections Center report, Mr. Jeffrey. Good afternoon again, board. The Community Corrections Programs Report is for July of 2018, item one. Our program totals, uh, male work release had 42 participants, female work release had five, juvenile house arrest, I'm sorry, adult house arrest had 131, and juvenile house arrest had 13 participants. Item two, our program revenues totals for the month of July, $67,108.29. Our program's expenses, and item three were $95,189.31. Item four, our program's completions. Work release had nine, house arrest had 38. Our program violations. Work release had seven, house arrest had nine. Item six, our program warrants. Work release has eight, house arrest has three. Item seven, our budget report for the year overtime is at 74, 74%, expenses at 54%, and revenue is at 63%. That concludes my report. Any questions from the director? Okay, if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve this report. So moved. Second. Uh, question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. The Thank you, board. Thank you. Report is Thank you, Brian. Board and Betty. Report. Good afternoon, uh, board. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The uh, average daily in house population for the month of July was 824 inmates. The overtime report, out of county boarding, and the community service report are all attached. The staffing update currently, our correctional officer numbers break down to the following, and there's a little typo there. Our uniform staff on shift is 171. Our part time officers, 10. We have two that are out on workers' comp. One out on continuous FMLA, two on administrative leave, and two vacancies for a total of 178 officers. A new class started today at the jail, uh, consisting of nine full-time officers and 10 part-time officers, and they're included in those numbers that I just gave you. Um, these new officers will undergo orientation and training for six weeks and will be on shift in early October. FMLA, we have 27 officers that are, have intermittent FMLA and one officer, as mentioned above, on continuous FMLA. That amounts to 15.7% of the COs. Mm -hmm. The budget, as of July 31st, the revenue is at 57% and expenses are also at 57%. Juveniles, currently we're housing three juveniles, two males and a female. Inmates at or past their minimum date, 23. We have five with no home plan. And again, I apologize, another typo. We have one of the five in our community service program. Two individuals, uh, parole has been denied due to an un unacceptable home plan or misconduct. Nine have submitted home plans and they're awaiting paroling action. Six have been remanded for the balance of their sentence and one is in New Jersey. Extraordinary occurrence reports, there were three since the last prison board meeting. On 724, a county inmate had to be placed into the restraint chair for his own safety after he was found to have smeared feces all over his cell, throwing it into the day room, and he broke the corner observation mirror in his cell. On 727, a, a county inmate attempted suicide by hanging. Responding staff commenced CPR, and an ambulance was called. That individual was transferred to the CMC and unfortunately passed away at the hospital. On 816, 
A county inmate was refusing to comply with orders to remove items from his cell. Eventually, he complied, but then he started to act in an aggressive manner once outside of his cell. Officers had, officers had to use pepper spray in order to obtain and, and maintain control of the individual, and he was placed in the emergency restraint chair to ensure the safety of all those who were involved. Priya, there were three Priya al um, allegations in the month of July. Two of the complaints are allegations of inmate on inmate sexual harassment, and the third is an allegation of staff on inmate sexual misconduct. All three allegations are currently under investigation. And this concludes my report. Anybody have any questions for the board? Yes. Um, with the 10 part time officers, are you seeing, are we have any, are we working for 10 officers? Uh, no, not at this point. They, they're going to go through the training first. Okay. Once that's completed, we'll be able to utilize them. Okay, great. So, when we see our OT numbers, they should come down? Yes. Uh, well, again, with the individuals who are out um, on administrative leave, continuous FMLA and workers' comp, after, after a 30 day period, and they're all at 30 days or beyond, uh, we can start utilizing the part timers to fill in there. I, I expect when the class is done, we're going to see the overtime come down for two reasons, that being one, and then the other is all the uh, full-time officers will then be on shift. Right. So I think in October, we're going to see a significant reduction in overtime. All right, good. Um, on this last graph page, it was cut off on the left side. Okay. Just uh, how many currently? Oh, I'm sorry. How many current county inmates do we have? Are you asking? Yeah, how many are county, state, and federal? What's the where's the breakdown for? That? Um, I don't have the county broken out, but we we averaged 824 inmates, and I know we averaged 201 U.S. Marshals, and we averaged uh, let me see if I got the number here 60 um, state parole violators. We also hold for other individuals, uh, other counties. Um, I don't think I have that breakdown right here, but right there just with the marshals and the state parole violators, that's 260 that you would subtract from the 824. So I, I'm thinking we're gonna be around 550 or somewhere in that neighborhood of Lackawanna County inmates in the, okay. in the facility. Is there a way we can break that down in the future? Yeah, oh, I could definitely do that for, for next month. I'd appreciate that. And also I noticed that um, as of July of last year, we were at 946 inmates, and now we're down to 824. Um, I know that in some of our meetings, we were talking about how the numbers have come down for yes. uh, incarcerations, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that and why that's happening. I, I really think, and I'm not uh, just uh, stroking the judge's uh, um, manes on this one, I really think that the progressiveness of the courts, it, and, and that's what we're seeing, because they're utilizing a lot of other they're using a lot of other programs that are out there, uh, whether it be uh, house arrest with Mr. Jeffers, or if it's uh, probation, they have all sorts of treatment courts, drug court, uh, veterans court, domestic violence court, all, all different courts. I think by using alternatives to incarceration, I think that's why our numbers really dumb. There's a, there's a natural kind of ebb and flow that goes with incarceration too. There are times when we're up, times when we're down, but uh, where our numbers are at right now, I think that's very attributable to the, uh, to the judges and the sentencing options that they have. It would be interesting to see if the stats were the same across the state. I would wonder if there was a... If it's a statewide reduction. Is it, is it a county reduction or is it a state reduction? I, I don't know, but I, c I can get my hands on stats uh, through through our wardens association and find out what other counties are experiencing and I'm sure that the state has uh, statistics on it as well yeah because I was looking to see the difference between the county inmates for that specific reason to see if it's a county issue state federal um, so uh, maybe I can go back with you at one time and look at the previous years for state federal and oh, sure. uh, county inmates as well and see if there was a difference in those numbers yeah 
because we really that's very interesting to see those numbers come down I'm, I'm happy about that I'm happy with that our numbers are coming down so. and I think electronically I have uh, I would say over five years of that statistical information electronically on my computer so I should be able I think I can go back to 2010 maybe even 2009 with those numbers well if we implemented programs starting last June and it's our county numbers that came down then that's a, de a definite testament to the judges and the work they're doing and I think that they should be recognized for that right so if that's the case I think um, I would be definitely interested in knowing and uh, have the ability to thank them for the work that they're doing and the programs they've initiated okay I will I'll work on getting you those charts and numbers and everything I have as well as reaching out to the state uh, to see what kind of statistics they have awesome thank you very much you're welcome Thank you. Judge Bravo and Judge Brazier, oh, you were complimenting their names. No problem. They're being. Well, let's get the numbers first and see if they're responsible. A lot of this they actually were getting through on their minimum. <coughs> okay. And the chambers do a lot of it too. Anybody from the public yeah, wish to uh, step forward? Part of three. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, we'll. Uh, I'll, I'll entertain the motion. Uh, accept the so word. Moved. And a second. Second. On the question. All in favor? Aye. Board's report for July of 2018 is approved. Yes, Now, Mr. Bolas. Thank you. Good afternoon, Bob Bolas, Scranton. Uh, back to my same old issue about pillows. You know, if you're sitting in the jail and you're sleeping on one of the mattresses, uh, the word of knows. Uh, you know, they're like something you throw in your pool to have a little built up end for a mattress or a pillow. But try and sleep on them is one of the most uncomfortable things you'll ever do. I spent time there. I could tell you I had a neck injury and uh, you tried to make a pillow out of anything you had in your locker or your foot locker or whatever it was. We're spending millions and millions of dollars in the county. I don't see any reason in the world we can't buy pillows. It's not going to hurt to try it. It may help with some of the temperament with people that you get a better night's sleep. You maybe have a better uh, temperament in the morning and dealing in the confinement and everything else that goes with it. The stress, the mental uh, change to people, it may be a benefit. I see no reason we can't try it. We're buying a pillow, whether they're state, uh, whatever they tell us they want. Uh, pillowcases, they get washed, they're reused again. Uh, I think it's just a foolish thing that we're not trying to do something here to uh, give us a better night's sleep and maybe take care of some of the issues we have there. That's just dealing with temperament. We deal with PTSD, whether it's in the military or we're dealing with it in a jail. And I brought up PTSD earlier, uh, you know, with our commissioners about what we're trying to get done with our military. But possibly we could get a grant through the prison system for PTS treatment uh, that would also involve our vets. A combination type treatment, uh, getting a grant to do that, I think it's something we should look into. If there's available money out there and we could save one life, it's worth our effort to go ahead and do. So if we can't get it through the county one way, maybe we could get it, the treatment through another way and that's through the prison system. There's all kind of money flowing out there, so I think we could become creative enough to uh, help ourselves to the funds that are out there for our people and have a combination program with PTSD for inmates as well as uh, treatment for our vets, giving them an opportunity, and uh, we kill two birds with one stone. Uh, the other thing I have is uh, you know, some of the we have uh, an issue I have anyway, I have with the logo of correctional care. I was withheld medical treatment out there that literally put my life in danger. And that's backed up by medical facts. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. You're excused, Pat. Thanks. <laughs> and with the medical stuff, and I'm going off the hip, uh, I'm not worried about that in any way, shape, or form. I brought it up more than once of what I was denied the medical treatment. 
And I've heard from other inmates that have been in there. Uh, I saw what was going on when I was there. I think at this juncture, <clears throat> I think we need to get an outside review, a medical review from medical uh, professionals of uh, correctional care, the treatment that's being given to inmates, not only uh, checking what he's done, but also speak to the inmates that presumably were treated to see if it was satisfactory and if medications and things were withheld. I think it's important at this juncture right now. Uh, I'm pursuing uh, an issue with Zalogo. I didn't take to the fact that uh, I was on a treatment that was uh, life-threatening and he would held that treatment because of cost or whatever the issue was. And uh, it's time now for accountability. I let it go this long and uh, I promised him a long time ago. He refused to testify before the board. I waived my HIPAA rights, everything to it, and he refused to uh, talk about any treatment he did or didn't do. Well, now I'm going to hold him accountable where he's going to be able to talk about it. Okay. People like this that have people in confinement, sometimes they get a, a supreme being feeling that they're invincible and they know everything. Well, not everybody knows everything and uh, accountability is the most important thing that we have, especially in the prison system. And I think in this county we're doing what's right for the people that are in there, abuse or whatever may be, allegations, whether they're truthful or false, at least we're looking at the whole system and giving anybody a fairness. And I think on the medical side, that's never been brought up. And I think it's time now that we have accountability in the, uh, the prison of the medical treatment that correctional pair isn't providing, and yet he's getting paid to do it by the MH, you pay to see him. And the other thing is uh, we got a lot of politicians running around the state right now want to reelect and all this, and they're pushing for sanctuary cities. So we may not even have to worry about having the jail anymore the way they're going. We're going to have them running all over the city. Uh, what the hell do we need a jail for? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? Hello, I'm Marie Killian from Dunmore, and I'm also a member of uh, Progressive Women of Northeastern PA. Uh, I was trying to find a human resources policy and procedures for the Lackawanna County Prison. Does one exist? What? For human resources? Are we talking about human resources for uh, the prison? No, 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 for employees of the prison. Is there a policy and procedure? Yes. The overall. Where would I find that? I don't know that there's a. So there is not a separate one for county employees compared to pr county prison employees. It's all the same? Well, they're all county employees. Yes. They'd be no different than, you know, children. And okay, youth. all right. I understand. Where would I find it? Oh no, 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 no. They got found under the same umbrella. All county employees. They don't have their own separate HR. Well, I was able to find a collective bargaining agreement between Lackawanna County and the American Federation of State County and Municipal Employees District Council. 87 AFL-CIO, effective January 1st of 2013 to December 31st of 2017. Is there a more current version or would that continue on? Um, I had requested those, all of the union contracts be put up online for the public to view. If the current one is not up there, I will make sure that I get it up there. If, thank if it's you. not there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Assuming that Article 24 has not changed, it re, it's, it's on page 35 and it's regarding discipline. Notice of disciplinary action shall be issued within a reasonable period of time after the conclusion of an investigation. 
this is regarding uh, the uh, staff of the uh, Alaquan County Prison. My question is, what positions within the county and or the prison determine the validity of disciplinary action? Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. <clears throat> there is a rule here that says notice of disciplinary action shall be issued within a reasonable period of time after the conclusion of an investigation. This is regarding a guard. My question, what positions within the county and or the prison determine the validity of a disciplinary? I can't answer the validity part of it because every case, it's their case by case issue. Some, some investigations, there's validity to them, others there's not. But yes. I think what you might be asking, that collective bargaining agreement covers uh, the treatment of Correctional officers, counselors, sergeants. I understand that. But what I'm asking is when a guard has been accused of something, obviously there is an investigation. What position, what person is in charge of determining whether it is a valid issue or whether it did not happen? Uh, I work hand in hand with the HR department, the deputy director of human resources for the county. Um, Justin McGregor, he and I, of course, I rely on the staff that conducted the investigation as well, if it's an in-house prison. Okay, so that's the standard operating procedure, you and the HR director. Okay. And the second thing is, under the same Article 24, the employer need not follow progressive disciplinary acts for <clears throat> substantial breach of security, any deviation from written policies and procedures that result or can reasonably result in physical harm to staff, volunteers, visitors, inmates, or bystanders. My question there is, as it states in section six, video cameras are used to support discipline if there is independent evidence of a disciplinary infraction including allegation of officer misconduct or inmate abuse. The question is this, are video cameras used in all common areas used by prisoners and have these recordings been used to prove or disprove allegations of inmate abuse? How many persons have access to these recordings and how long are they kept? Uh, we have camera a camera system that goes throughout the entire prison. Not every single cell has a camera in it. Every day room, every common area has a camera in it. We do use the, the footage from those cameras when necessary. If we hear that there's, well, let's just use an example of a fight between two inmates. We're not sure who, we, who, who was participating in that fight because there was a big crowd around it. Well, we'll go to the cameras, we'll identify those individuals, and we will use that against them. Is, is that what you were shooting for? Um, How long are the video recordings kept? Video recordings, they're, they're on DVDs, and it depends on the level of activity. There's only so much memory that's involved with each DVD. Okay. So a low activity area will have a longer period of time that you can go back. Would but a, but a very a busy activity, no, maybe two months. Two months. Yeah. Okay. And the last thing I wanted to know is how many persons have access to the video recordings? The video recordings are, uh, and Dave, you can correct me if I'm wrong, lieutenants and up. Excuse lieutenants, captains, deputy warden, myself. Several people. Yeah. Okay. All in all, probably about 15 people. Thank you. Thank you all. Anybody else? Hello, board. My name is Beth Ann Zero. I'm a resident of Dunmore, co-founder of NEPA Prison Advocates. Um, really happy to hear about the GED program being approved. Um, 
but I did have some questions about it. How long is the contract for the GED? Will it be going up for bid again afterwards is really my concern. Um, and will we be able to see what exactly um, is covered with the contract? Because initially when it was presented a few months ago, it started out at approximately $120,000. And what I had heard was that it is now $153,000 plus an $11,000 startup. So that was quite an increase from the initial, initial start that we had a few months ago. Um, so I was just concerned as where did all the extra come from? Where we had one idea of what it was going to be and then tacked on another $40,000, which is 30 some percent of what the initial idea was. I mean, I realized that that was just a rough estimate going in, but 30 some percent seems like a big difference from what that rough estimate was. Um, but I am happy that we are moving forward with that because it's items like that that will continue to help reduce the prison population, um, reduce that recidivism rate, give people an idea of what they can do different from what they did before they were going in. Some of them just didn't know how to live before that. Um, I'm also deeply concerned about this most recent suicide. Um, it was listed as a suicide attempt, but apparently they succeeded since they did die at the hospital. Did this inmate express previously before committing suicide, were they seen by a psychiatrist? Was there a time lapse between? Um, and does this reflect back on the medical contract that we are under now. Um, so those are my basic concerns right now is we've talked before about how sometimes somebody would um, be attempting to hurt themselves and it could be three or four days before they see a psychiatrist depending on what day of the week it is. Um, is there a way to have I, I understand that the guards are not fully trained to deal with mental illness in this way. They go through training, but that's basic training. It doesn't give them the ability to counsel people when they're in that position, not to the extent that they need. Um, well, the person is, is assessed when they come in, even if the psychiatrist is not on site. They're assessed by the medical personnel that are there. They uh, have a minimum amount of training required to make an assessment whether this person presents a danger to themselves or a danger to others. If they conclude based on the presentation that the person needs to be isolated, they, that inmate will be isolated and put him in a camera cell uh, by himself and they'll be under supervision. I don't know about this particular, that's, that's generally the protocol until they can be seen by the, the psychiatrist. Uh, in this particular instance, Because I know, um, personally, when it comes to suicide, the isolation isn't going to relieve the intent and, if anything, increase it. You're right. But what it can do is uh, it increases the observation and, and, and you know, can at least intensify the attention that's paid to that person as opposed to an inmate who doesn't demonstrate any uh, or suggest any of those tendencies when they're just, you know, put in a cell. Is there a way that we could alleviate the time period between when they're put into isolation to when they're actually receiving treatment? Well, and again, based on the medical assessment that's, that's there, and if, if they're assessed to the point where there's going to be too much time, then they can be transferred to Right, and they can be, but are they? I guess would be my question. I think in, in the judgment of the medical personnel, that that's what's in their best interest, and I think they will be yes. Just like any other type of medical condition that they're presented with, if you're not a you know, for instance, who's undergoing a, a, a myocardial infarction that requires acute care in an ER that they can't 
Right, and I understand that, but I know at one of our previous meetings we did ask how long a period it could be, and in some cases it was actually days. It can be days until they're seen by the psychiatrist, the prison psychiatrist, but that doesn't, it, it, that doesn't mean that that's the only option available. Again, it's based on the assessment that's made of the inmate at the time. Okay, thank you. Am I accurate, Warden? I was just going to ask that Second because I thought... Say, am I accurate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that was that's my understanding of the protocol. Judge, the previous contracts, I mean, we had the contracts to look at, and the other contracts that we had to deal with would have left us with um, professionals that were out of state. And that's why we they were unacceptable contracts. The, the time frame, if, if Warren Betty wanted to expand on, on my assumption on that. I remember we were discussing the bit major problem was in regards to, Did you want yes, to could you please? Sure because that was one of the issues that we had discussed in, in, in the contracts that we had, the three that we had. Right, and before I get to uh, Commissioner Cummings' point, I, I just wanted to say that we do have um, suicide identification and prevention training. Um, when an individual is committed to the facility, we are asking the agency bringing that person in about uh, if there were any expressions of suicidal ideations at that point. Uh, we have, I believe it's five to seven questions we ask the individual at the time of commitment. Just the co correctional staff ask these questions. Somebody from our nursing department comes over and they do a, a quick assessment at that point because we just got this person in. We, we have to get our, 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 our bookings done and, and get the person safely and securely set up. Um, so within the first hour, that person is asked or asked about at least three times to the arresting agency, transporting agency, our correctional staff, and correctional care staff. We all ask that individual about suicidal ideations, thoughts, past attempts, significant dates coming up in the future. They're all, they're all keys that throw up red flags. Um, and, and we're all very aware of that. And, and our, our stance has always been that we're going to we're going to be safe rather than sorry. So if we if we come across something that puts up a red flag, we're immediately contacting our medical health care provider. And we're saying, take a look at this individual because he said this or she said this or uh, the person's crying or, or whatever the case is. And we will uh, err on the side of caution. We will put that person, we have different levels of watches, behavioral watches, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, constant watches where we sit an officer outside of your cell who's, whose job is to observe you constantly. And we, of course, have camera cells as well. Um, with that said, uh, you're right, Commissioner, one of, the, one of the issues when we're going through the uh, medical health care RFP, one of the issues that worked in favor of uh, correctional care was the localness of the individuals. They have they have subcontracted with a local psychiatrist. He comes out, um, I believe he comes out two days a week. Uh, if, and of course, he's on call. And um, we call him. We also have a contract with Scranton Counseling Center. We have a uh, master's level mental health provider who I, I couldn't tell you exactly how many hours, but it's well in excess of 20 hours a week that he's at our facility. We have a psychologist, uh, that's Dr. Ruby who's on staff, he's, he's part-time, he deals predominantly with, with um, our sex offender population, but he's there. And in the past, when we've had an issue and he's on site, we will call him to go talk to that individual. We have um, all of our sergeants, and I believe about, at this point, about 20 to 30 correctional officers and counselors who have all gone through CIT training. And uh, part of our basic training is we have a full day dedicated to mental health first aid as well. So hopefully that answers it. Thank you very much, Warden. Good that, job, thank uh, you. Responsive, Beth? Yes. Okay. Anybody else from the public? Hello, I'm Dr. Stephanie Bressler from 1402 East Gibson Street in Scranton, and I'm representing Progressive Women of Northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, we, Progressive Women of Northeastern Pennsylvania, have been coming to prison board meetings since December of 2016 
following the filing of the amended federal lawsuit alleging sexual abuse of female inmates at the prison. Since then, a number of other lawsuits have been filed. Um, most recently, one alleging abuse from a guard who had been cleared to return to his work at the prison. Uh, and in addition, there has been a statewide grand jury uh, convened to look at um, sexual abuse at the prison. We learned at the commissioner's meeting today that legal bills related to the grand jury's probe of sexual abuse have now exceeded uh, half a million dollars. Attorney Brazil told us that at the commissioner's meeting that the county is cooperating with the grand jury's investigation. My question today is how many prison board meeting, how many prison board members have thus far provided testimony to the grand jury? Well, since the proceedings before the grand jury are generally secret. I understand uh, that. I don't know, uh, I, I can't tell you about anybody other than myself. Uh, and, uh, I would have to leave it up to the, the individual board members to decide whether or not they wish to say yes or no. Uh, but I haven't. Okay, and I understand it's, it's the prerogative of the person providing testimony to identify himself or herself. I have not. I have not. Honestly, given the nature of the secrecy of the grand jury, I recommend you go and answer those questions. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? All right, if not, I'll entertain a motion as well. Anybody, uh, uh, members of the business? Any business from any of the other members? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. On the question? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you.